Tim London, The Invisible Man. These five characters and the original films that they appeared in, all created between 1931 and 1935, represent the cornerstone of the universal monster cycle of films. They are some of the most famous images in cinema history, known around the world by millions and millions of people, certainly everybody here, but most interestingly, by millions more who have never even seen these original films. The people who starred in the films, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Elsa Lanchester, also known by millions of people around the world. And in the case of Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, their personalities and their images are known by millions who have never even seen the films. Even the people who work behind the scenes, James Whale, Todd Browning, who directed several of them, and Jack Pierce, who created the look known by tens of thousands of classic cinema fans. But the person most responsible for these films existing in the first place is almost completely unknown, and his name was Carl Lemley Jr. Yeah. Or Junior Lemley. Yes, as he was known. He was just 23 years old, and he was in charge of Universal Studios when these films were made, and he personally chose to make them, develop them, and fought to get them through production. Now, I will admit that growing up in the 70s when I first was a monster kid, like a lot of people here, I'd never heard of, of Carl Lemley Jr. either. It was only years later when I was now working in the film business and I rediscovered these films that I wanted to look into how they were made and I read about how they were produced and I came upon Junior Lemley and I couldn't get my head around the fact that there was a 23 year old running a movie studio, number one, and number two, that, that he was the one that had chosen to make these films. Now, I will admit that I was a writer at this point and I was looking to see if maybe there was a story to tell in this sort of unusual circumstance. And I also became particularly obsessed with wanting to find out why. Why did he choose to make these films? Well, in order to do that, I realized I had to learn as much as possible about him, and that's what I set out to do. Carl Lemley Jr. comes into the world on April 28, 1908. He comes into the world named Julius Lemley. Shortly thereafter, his name is changed to uh, Carl Lemley Jr. and then Junior Lemley, as he's known for the rest of his life. He is the second child and first son of Carl Lemley and Rekha Stern Lemley, and he has a sister named Rosabelle, who was born about four or five years before him. At the time of his birth, his far father, Carl Lemley, is in his early 40s. He's an immigrant to this country, and most interestingly, he's two years into a complete change of career. Up until two years before Junior was born, he was a successful businessman living in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, somewhat a pillar of the society up there and of the town, when he decided to throw all of that away and enter the brand new film business. This is the very beginning of the movie business, and he decides to enter it. And he does this first by buying a movie theater called the White Front Theater. This is a Nickelodeon where people paid a nickel to go see films. This went very well, and within a matter of months, he expanded to multiple theaters. Within two years, he decided to get into the business of distributing films, not just to his theaters, but to other movie theaters. The next year, in 1909, he decided that wasn't good enough. He wanted to start making his own movies. So he, he first established the Independent Moving Picture Company, or the IMP, as it was known, and started making movies. Three years later, he joins with several other independent film companies with himself at the head and founds Universal Films, and then all of this reaches a crescendo in 1915 when he establishes Universal City Studios out here just down the road for where we are at this very moment. So in nine years, he's gone from entering the film business to now being one of the largest producers of films for the entire United States. Pretty, pretty impressive. Well, while this is going on, Junior is getting, is growing himself. This is a picture of Junior watching uh, a motion picture demonstration from 1915. Junior is about seven years old, and like most kids, wanted to know what his dad did for a living. He's the young kid in the lower right-hand corner, and Carl Lemley is in the center, the, the bald gentleman watching this demonstration. Over the next few years, Junior is a regular presence at Universal and pretty much had the run of the place. He was referred to as uh, the Prince of Universal. And his father used this image of a precocious kid running around to, to kind of, it was a good marketing thing. So a lot of pictures appeared in the trade papers and in the newspapers of Junior's exploits. Here he is fooling around with James Corbett 
who was the heavyweight champion of the world at this point and also happened to be making a film for Universal at the time. And here's another fun picture of Junior at the age of about 10 directing a movie. Again, all, all having a good time with the image of this kid running around. Well, the end of the decade finds the Lemleys doing very well. The, though the studio is on the West Coast, they live in New York at this point because that's still the center of the film business at this point. They've relocated from Chicago. And it's a great exist existence. Junior is going to a prestigious private school, spends a lot of time in California on the, uh, at the movie lot, and they live in this wonderful apartment at 378 West End Avenue. Uh, big apartment with maids and servants, just an idyllic existence. And then almost overnight, it comes to a crashing end. In late 1918, the Spanish flu sweeps through America, killing thousands and thousands of people. And like what we just went through, the film business is affected and theaters are shut down and production slows a bit. But it's on a personal level that Junior is particularly affected. His mother, Reca, catches the Spanish flu and in early 1919, she dies. So Junior is now 11 years old and is motherless. Well, as you can expect, this devastated the, the remaining members of the, the family. But over the next several years, it also seems to have brought them closer together as they're constantly photographed together, either in New York, in California, or traveling uh, abroad as, as they often did together. And during this time, Junior is now a teenager and his interest in the film business had gone from that of being a precocious kid to now being something a little bit more serious. So much so that when it came time to graduate high school, unlike most kids of his class and that he went to school with who went off to Ivy League schools, Junior decided to enter the family business. So instead of going to college, he heads out to Universal City and starts producing films. The first thing he does is a series of shorts called The Collegians about college life during this period. It follows several characters as they make their way through college. So in essence, instead of going to college, Junior makes films about college. With the, uh, the series goes very well, and with the success, his father realizes that now this is clearly what Junior is gonna do. He's gonna be in the film business, so uh, Carl Lemley decides to finally buy a house in California. Previously, when they would visit, they would either stay on the studio lot there were bungalows there for relatives and visitors or at any of the fancy hotels. But now it's clear this is where the family is gonna be. So he buys this big mansion called Diaz Dorados in Benedict Canyon, just a beautiful giant mansion with a swimming pool, everything you can imagine from this era. And almost immediately, they become famous for throwing parties. Tons of articles in this period in the paper, in the trades, talk about parties at the Lemleys. Um, often listing who attended, uh, what was what was served on, uh, you know, for, for dinner or the buffet, and lots of memoirs mention going to parties at the Lemleys. Uh, Bud Schulberg, the legendary screenwriter who wrote on the waterfront many years later, was a young uh, a young screenwriter at this point, and he talks about in his book about going to a party at the Lemleys, and he enters or he ends the chapter with a very cryptic note where he says he left before it got too out of hand. <laughs> I'll leave that to you to decide what, what exactly happened there. <laughs> so with the success with the shorts, the next logical thing was for Junior to start making features. One of the first ones he made, Junior is now all of 20 years old, and he produces this film called Lonesome, which is about two young people who meet each other, uh, they live alone, and they meet each other at Coney Island and have a wonderful day together. It's a terrific film, and it's one of those where you watch it and you feel like you're really getting a sense of what it was like to be alive during this era. And it's also kind of endemic of what Junior was bringing to the films he was making. These were much more youthful, cosmopolitan films. Universal had been known previously for stuff made for more rural areas, for westerns, but Junior had this youthful energy that he was bringing to what he was doing. Uh, I'm gonna take a drink here for one second. So, with the success of this, uh, this is a great piece of, of advertising from the film. The other thing that's interesting to, to point out is that Junior had entered the business right around the time that the talking picture came in. Lonesome is one of those films that straddled both eras from the silent to the um, talking film, and it was originally shot as a silent, and they added some talking sequences to it. 
If you notice on this advertisement for Lonesome, there's a film at the bottom called Melody of Love, and it says it's Universal's first all-talking film. Well, there's a great story connected to this having to do with Junior. Universal was one of the studios that was behind the curve when sound came in and didn't quite have enough equipment. So Junior worked out a deal where he borrowed some equipment from Fox Films to shoot a test, as he called it. Fox was a competitor, but they figured, well, we're gonna let him have it for two days. What, what damage could he do? <laughs> well, what Junior did is he shot an entire feature in two days, working around the clock. So that shows you what the, the energy he was bringing to what he was doing. This was not lost on his father, so for Junior's 21st birthday, he gave him perhaps the ultimate birthday present. He put him in charge of the entire studio. Oh <laughs> so Junior is now 21 years old, and he's now in charge of the entire slate of films. Now you can imagine the reaction in Hollywood, the screams of nepotism echoed amongst the canyons like you wouldn't believe. But Junior pretty much ignored him, put his head down, went to work, and did what any kid with a rich father would do. He started spending the old man's money. <laughs> he started making a bunch of really expensive, splashy films. He made a, a big musical called Broadway in 1929. He followed that up with a color musical called King of Jazz in 1930. Yes, terrific film. He wasn't done. He made All Quiet on the Western Front in 1930. Yes. This, this was a big budget film that was from a controversial book at the time, but Junior uh, went ahead and made it, and the film came out and was a big hit. But it wasn't just a big financial hit, it was also a big hit with the critics. So now the articles about Junior begin to change a little bit. Now people start to say, okay, maybe this kid knows what he's doing, maybe it isn't gonna be such a disaster that he's in charge of a movie studio. In fact, later that same year, in 1930, All Quiet wins Best Picture at the 1930 Academy Awards. This is a picture of his father receiving the Best Picture Oscar from Louis B. Mayer. Even though Junior was running the studio, his father was still head of the company, so it, he's in the picture receiving the award. Well, all of this success was not lost on the young ladies and actresses of Hollywood, and as Luella Parsons, the famous uh, gossip columnist, pointed out, it's difficult for young Carl to keep his balance these days with half the ingenues ogling it. And over the next few years, in every gossip column, he's linked to yet another actress, either about to get married, about to elope, every, anything you can imagine. So it's at this moment, with all this success, that Junior makes a turn that all of us here are very thankful for. Dracula. Yeah. Yeah. Dracula was a popular book that had been out for about 30 years, but for the most part, the studios stayed away from this type of dark material. There had been an unauthorized version made in Germany, Nosferatu, but the major Hollywood studios wanted nothing to do with this, but Junior was intrigued and thought it would make a good film. After all, the studio that he was now in charge of had a little bit of a history with this type of material, having produced these films, over the years that were all kind of dark and in a similar vein. But there was a big <coughs> distinction with these films. In all of these films, what started as something supernatural and otherworldly, by the end of the film was revealed to be somebody, somebody real doing it for greed or for uh, uh, revenge. For lack of a better term, the Scooby-Doo reveal always happened in, the, in these films by the end of it. But Dracula was a completely different thing. In Dracula, Dracula really is a vampire, not somebody pretending to be one, and can only be killed with a wooden stake driven through his chest into his heart. Pretty gruesome stuff. Nonetheless, Junior decided to proceed. Well, you can imagine the reaction from everybody was this is gonna be a disaster. Uh, his father thought it was a terrible idea. Nobody thought it was a good idea, but he proceeded, and the first thing he did was buy the rights to the Broadway play. That had uh, been a hit on Broadway, had been circling the country and touring versions ever since then. And with all of this reaction, he decided the way to, to assuage people's fears was to put together a great package to ensure the success. So he gets Lon Chaney to star in the movie, who he had some success previously with Universal, and he gets Todd Browning to direct it. And it th figures it's gonna be a great package, everything will be a terrific. Unfortunately, Lon Chaney then passes away about a month before they're gonna be begin production. 
So now there's a big scramble. Junior wants to continue to make this film. So he starts auditioning lots of different people before finally landing on the premiere and after Bella Lugosi. Yeah. Yes, round of applause. Bella Lugosi had starred on Broadway in Dracula and had been a big success and had even done some of the touring companies. But it took a while before they finally cast him in the film. In fact, he would grouse years later that he was given the role after everybody and their pets was auditioned. <laughs> the film shoots primarily in October 1930. It's a, it's, a, it's a good shoot. It goes a little longer than expected, but somehow comes in under budget, which I find absolutely stunning uh, with my own experiences in production. It's a great picture on the, the left of Todd Browning looking up at Lugosi, and on the right, a favorite picture of mine of Lugosi relaxing between takes with a cigar next to a fan. Just a great image. So the film wraps and enters post-production, and now while the film is being put together for release, Universal starts to figure out how are we gonna market this unusual film, and they come up with the tagline, the strangest passion the world has ever known which explains why they open it right around Valentine's Day. <laughs> the, the film comes out, and as everybody knows, is a big hit, uh, breaks lots of box office records, and all around, Junior has been vindicated again. So what does he decide to do? He decides to double down. Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. Frankenstein, the novel, had been around for over a hundred years, and again, this type of dark material had been largely ignored by the Hollywood studios. There had been, 20 years earlier, a very primitive version made by Edison that had kind of come and gone and been forgotten, but the rest of the studios didn't want any part of it. But Junior decided that he thought it could make a really interesting movie, so he acquires the rights, and as this article from 1931 states, uh, the hope is that Universal is hoping it will prove another Dracula. Well, the reaction this time is even more intense that it's a terrible idea. His father thinks it's awful, the executives think it's awful, and all the other studios in town think it's a terrible idea. As this article states, the Lemleys to continue with gaudy shockers instead of following the rest of Hollywood for a comedy year. So at this point, the Great Depression is in full swing, and all the studios figure the last thing people want to see is something like Frankenstein, and they're making sort of light, fair, and comedies. But Junior is undeterred and decides to proceed. Robert Flore is a young French director, and he is given the task of taking the book and turning it into a movie. He comes in to pitch the movie to Junior, and in his biography years later, Flore would say it was one of the craziest pitch meetings he ever had, because as he was telling him, his take on Frankenstein, Junior was getting a haircut, getting a manicure, talking into a dictaphone, putting a bet down with a bookie, uh, something which we'll get to later uh, about horse racing with Junior. Uh, but all of this was going on, nonetheless it made an impression, and Junior hired Robert Flory to write and direct Frankenstein. Now, I don't want to give you the impression, though, that Junior wasn't taking the project seriously, because at this same time, Jack Pierce would say in interviews later that Junior Lemley personally gave him a copy of the book. I can tell you from my experience and anybody that's worked in uh, the film business, the head of a studio handing a book directly to a makeup artist is pretty darn unusual. So it shows you how important this project was uh, to Junior. So with all of this preparation going on, now it's time to find out somebody to star in Frankenstein. This is the uh, piece, the first artwork that was ever created for Frankenstein uh, was for the Universal Exhibitor book in early 1931. This is sent out to movie theaters to tell them what Universal has coming down the pike in terms of the movies it's gonna release. And as you see on this poster, the name most prominently listed is Bela Lugosi. Bela Lugosi had become a star from Dracula, so the logical thing was that Bela Lugosi would star in Frankenstein. So Junior puts him in Frankenstein. Well, there was another star on the lot at this time, and his name was James Whale. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> James Whale was an English director who had made his name in the United Kingdom with a very successful play and then movie of a World War I story called Journey's End that was uh, very, went over very, very well. And when he came to Hollywood, there was a big bidding war for his services 
Junior won this bidding war, signed him to a multi-picture deal, and immediately put him in charge of another World War I story called Waterloo Bridge. While this film is going through production and then enters post-production and is being put together, Junior really likes what he sees and he decides he wants to get James Whale onto his next movie right away. So he brings him into his office and he says, like what you've done, this is a, a list of every film where we've got about to be made, you can pick whatever you want. And he decides to pick Frankenstein. So on July 1st, 1931, about two months before they start shooting, suddenly uh, Robert Flory is removed from the project and James Whale is attached as director and Garrett Fort is brought in now to rewrite it. Well, as you see in this same article, we're two months from production and Bela Lugosi is still listed as leading the cast. A week later, that changes. Uh, suddenly, Bela Lugosi is gone from the project. Bella, as it says here, Bela Lugosi, who was originally slated for Frankenstein, has been assigned a role in Murders of the Rue Moore. Now, there's different versions of what occurred here. In the way that Junior would tell it in later years, he saw a screen test that Robert Flory had made and didn't like what he saw and removed him from the project. Bella Lugosi would say that he left the project because the last thing he wanted to be was, as he put it, was a mute scarecrow in a, in a film that didn't want to be in Frankenstein. The end result is the same. Bella Lugosi is no longer part of Frankenstein. Enter Boris Karloff. At this moment in time, Boris Karloff is in his early 40s and for lack of a better term, is a struggling, starving actor. He's been in Hollywood for 10 years. He's been in over 80 movies. Wow. But all of these were maybe two days at this studio, two days at that studio, maybe a week if he was lucky. It's very much the hand-to-mouth existence of an actor. One day, he's sitting in the commissary at Universal, and James Whale walks up to him and says, I'm making this film called Frankenstein. Would you like to audition for the part of the monster? Well, of course, Karloff says yes. He's an actor, always wants to you know, get a role in a movie. But kind of like Lugosi, years later, he would grouse that he was happy to be offered the role, but he would happen to be dressed very nicely that day, and he was a little hurt that he was being asked to be a monster. <laughs> very much tongue-in-cheek the way uh, Karloff was. Nonetheless, he begins the process and is cast in Frankenstein. Well, Junior, seeing that he doesn't have a star in his movie now, he decides to reach out to MGM to see if he can get Leslie Howard to be in his movie. Leslie Howard is an actor who's beginning to make his name. He's a strong leading man, and Junior tries to work out a loan out from MGM. Deal falls apart, and James Whale says, no problem, I know the perfect actor. I worked with him back in the United Kingdom, and his name is Colin Clive. So Junior says, great, let's get him. So now Colin Clive is cast in the role of Dr. Frankenstein. And this is where things get very interesting. About three weeks before the beginning of production on Frankenstein, Colin Clive begins his journey from the United Kingdom to, to Universal City to shoot Frankenstein. And the first step of that is he takes a boat to New York, and then the idea is he's gonna get on a train and complete the journey. When he gets to the, when the ship docks in New York, there's a package waiting from him. And in this package is a copy of the script of Frankenstein, but there's also a letter to Colin Clive from James Whale. And what does it say in this letter? Bela Lugosi or Boris Karloff as the monster. So here we are just weeks from the beginning of production and suddenly Bela Lugosi's name is back in the mix. Well, what has happened? Clearly Junior has gotten very concerned about not having a star in his movie, not having a name, and he's starting to consider Bela Lugosi again. Shameless self-promotion, this is what I ultimately decided to write about this period of time, this back and forth between Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, and Junior Lemley as they're trying to figure out who exactly is gonna star in Frankenstein. Well, as we all know, the role goes to Boris Karloff. The film shoots on August 24th and goes until October 3rd. Again, it's a good production like Dracula. This one goes a little longer and goes over budget like they normally do when they go longer but it wraps up and everybody's pleased. In this era, films went, post went through post-production much quicker, quicker than today, so by the end of October, a mere three and a half weeks later, the film was ready to be seen by an audience for the first time. 
The Granada Theater in Santa Barbara is chosen for the first public exhibition of Frankenstein. The theater is still there, you can visit it. And on this day, on October 29th, 1931, a contingent from Universal drives up to watch this screening. Included is Junior Lemley and James Whale. Conspicuously not invited is Boris Karloff. Again, he's not known. Nobody's heard of him. Why, why would we invite him? The film screens that night, and when it ends, the audience kind of files out without saying anything. And there's a lot of consternation amongst this group from Universal, like, oh my god, what just happened? What, what did they think of our film? Well, later that night, there's an incident that is a hint of what's to come. About three o'clock in the morning, the manager of the Granada Theater gets a phone call from one of his patrons who happened to be at this first public screening of Frankenstein, and this patron says to him, if I can't sleep, then you shouldn't be able to. <laughs> and then he hangs up on him. So clearly the film has had a tremendous effect on the audience. Three weeks later, the film opens and if you'll pardon the bad pun, is a monster hit. <laughs> even bigger, yes. <laughs> even bigger than Dracula, breaks box office records almost everywhere that it plays. Dracula had gone on to be Universal's top film for 1931. Frankenstein would go on to be the top film for 1932. Well, unlike last time, when Universal had had a hit with Dracula, this time, after Frankenstein is hit, everybody decides to get into the business of making these films. And now all the other studios jump on the bandwagon. Another interesting thing that happens after this film comes on is a new term enters the lexicon of cinema, and that is the horror film. Before then, these films were called mysteries, shockers, thrillers, but now that it's clear that they're here to stay, they're called horror films, and from this moment forward, the term horror is used to describe these type of films. Well, Junior's a smart guy, and he starts making sequels to, to the films. Uh, we all know them, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Bride of Frankenstein. What's really interesting to notice is on the poster for The Mummy, this is now comes out about eight months after Frankenstein. Karloff is now so famous, he doesn't even need a first name. He's just Karloff, and his name is the size as the title of the movie. So that's how quickly his star rose. So Junior realizing that he also had these two stars uh, on his lot, he started pairing them together also in a series of movies that are beloved. The Black Cat, The Raven, The Invisible Grave. Lugosi and Karloff would go on to make nine movies together, uh, several of them at Universal, but not all of them. Other studios saw that this was, it was a good pairing. Well, it's around this same time that Junior gives a very interesting interview. As I mentioned, Luella Parsons, who was the famous gossip columnist then, uh, she would often write about Junior's romantic escapades in, in her articles, uh, but she would also talk about him very brightly. She really liked him and talk about him as a man of ambition, uh, a man with great ideas, and would regularly talk about running into him at parties and stuff, and in one of these articles, they get around to talking about the horror films. And in this article, Junior says something very interesting to her. Junior says, from the age of 11, I was always interested in the macabre and the occult. Well, what happened to Junior at the age of 11? His mother died. So clearly that loss must have been more than just a personal loss, but possibly a first taste of mortality, of the monster that waits for all of us. So, mid-1930s, Fine Junior still going strong, studio's doing well, the horror films are doing well, but he's never lost his, his desire to make big musicals, and he decides to make another one. He decides he's gonna make a, a big musical of Showbo. In fact, he gets James Whale to direct it, and it's gonna be a big production. Well, like studios do from time to time, they take out a $750,000 loan to cover just the costs of this production and other ones, and in order to insure the loan, his father has to put up his collateral, his stock in the movie studio. And the idea is, after six months, they'll pay back the loan, or the, the, the bank will give them more time. After all, what does a bank want with a movie studio? Well, unfortunately, after six months, they don't have the, the money to pay it back. Showboat hasn't finished yet, so they don't have the money to pay it back. And to their dismay, the bank pulls, uh, exercises the option and buys the studio out from under them. Oh, 
So now, 25 years after Carl Lemley founded Universal, he's forced to sell it and he's out from the studio that he started. About a month later, Junior leaves the studio. He's not gonna stick around without his dad there. And at this moment in time, they're both out of the film business. His father, being in his late 60s, takes this opportunity to retire. Junior, still being quite young, gets a, a gig almost immediately producing at MGM. And the idea is that he will start making horror films for that. Unfortunately, this doesn't work out, and within a year, Junior, uh, the deal falls through and he's no longer with MGM. So Junior is now less than 30 years old and is out of the film business. Two years later, his father passes away on September 24th, 1939. As you can imagine, his passing is a huge deal in Hollywood. He was one of the true pioneers and it's a, a huge, uh, he just gets all of the law, you know, gets all the credit that he deserves for being the pioneer and his funeral is a huge deal. It was covered on the radio. Uh, Etc. So now we've reached the end of the 1930s and the Lemleys are gone from the film business. But what they created most certainly wasn't. In fact, Junior had predicted this some years earlier when he said the cycle that we started with Dracula and Frankenstein can go on indefinitely. And boy, he wasn't kidding. Almost immediately when the new regime comes in, they start producing a series of sequels to the original horror films. They follow that up with a series of mashups uh, where they start putting all of the monsters together in several films, and then they're not done, they start making a bunch of comics. Yeah. And then, still not done, they make a final little cycle. Yeah. It's kind of a little mini cycle right at the end of the, of the major cycle. So while all of this is going on, while the uh, new regime is exploiting Junior, what Junior started, Junior himself is, is out there, you know, keeping busy, first off, by being a good American. World War II breaks out shortly after uh, his father passed away, and Junior enlists in the Army. He's stationed in New Jersey, and there's articles during this period of time of him serving during the week uh, at, the, uh, at the base, and then going into New York and living the high life uh, on the weekends. The war ends, Junior returns to Hollywood, and the idea is that he's gonna to continue to make uh, horror films and, and other films, and over the years, there's different mentions of projects, but sadly, none of these ever come to fruition. Another interesting article from this time, by the mid-1950s, Junior is in his late 40s, uh, but there's a con man going around the country pretending to be him and marrying widows, stealing all their money, and then disappearing. It's obviously not him. The, uh, this person is caught and put in jail and eventually actually passes away in jail. The real Junior Lemley never marries. In fact, by the mid-1950s, he's still living in that big house. His sister, Roosevelt, has married and moved out and his father has passed away. So it's finally decided that it's time to sell the big house and that's what the family does. But before they sell it, there's one last little taste of the film business for them the house appears in a film called The Americana, uh, where it portrays a south of the border Mexican cattle ranch. <laughs> Interesting to note, it's not a universal film. So it's, it's made by, by Archaea. So Junior moves out, he gets a new house in Benedict Canyon, much smaller but a nice house. And while he's settling in, an interesting thing happens. The horror films come back to life on television. Suddenly they explode in popularity. A package called Shock Theater is syndicated around the country and is incredibly popular and suddenly the horror films are more popular than ever because they're discovered by a whole new audience and that is kids. And so now we get an explosion in the late 50s and the early 60s of monster toys, the classic Aurora model kits, the monsters on television, uh, several magazines. Uh, talk about them, famous monsters being the most famous. Yeah. And, and now they're bigger than ever, now that they've been discovered by this new audience. The, the larger press takes note of this. Look Magazine puts Boris on the cover in 1964, asking why do our kids love monsters? Life Magazine in 68 celebrates 
the 150th anniversary of Frankenstein. Even the counterculture gets in on the action. <laughs> with Mad Magazine spoofing the monster craze, The Grateful Dead uses an image of Frankenstein on one of their classic 60s uh, posters from San Francisco. And my personal favorite, Dr. Frankenstein on campus, where now Dr. Frankenstein is a college professor tormented by radicals who creates the monster to avenge himself. So, and and while, this, while this craze is going on, though, things are not so great for Junior. He's now in his late 50s, and sadly, he gets diagnosed with MS. It's clear there's going to be no return to the film business, uh, but by all accounts, he, he still leads a very active social life. And the picture on the left, Junior is the person seated with the three people around him at this dinner party from 1968. And in the photo on the right, the gentleman not wearing glasses with the black and red tie is William Wyler, the very famous film director who had gotten his, his start some 30 or 40 years earlier at Universal and was also a distant relative of the, the Lemmings. So the monster craze continues throughout the 60s and perhaps reaches a crescendo in 1974. Wonderful film, but, but think of it in this context. We're now 40 years from the original horror films coming out. Mel Brooks, an A-list director, and Gene Wilder, an A-list actor, coming off of the biggest hit of their careers, Blazing Saddles. What do they decide to do with all of this power they have? They decide to make a wonderful homage to the original horror films. And even more interestingly, the film only works if the audience, which is now half of which, which at least is born after the cycle began, gets joke after joke after joke after joke in the movies based on those films, but that's how much in the zeitgeist these horror films are now, that the film is a huge hit, and perhaps is a, the ultimate tribute to what Junior had started. Five years later, on September 24th, 1979, Junior Lemley passes away at the age of 71, 40 years to the day that his father passed away. He's buried uh, about 30 miles south of here in the, in the Lemley family crypt. By all accounts, his passing is a very small deal, doesn't get much attention at all. Um, but interestingly, right before he died, something interesting did start to happen. All of those monster kids who had rediscovered the films in the 50s and early 60s had gotten a lot older and they were beginning to write about the horror films. Some of them had interviewed Junior before he passed away. Uh, and this is a letter from another author. This is a letter back to an author who had reached out also to talk to him, informing him, we're sorry, Junior has passed away and he can't talk to you, but best of luck with your project. I am of the belief that had Junior lived longer, he would have gotten more of the acclaim that he deserved because more people would have been able to talk to him. So lastly, I want to leave you with two thoughts about Carl Lemley Jr. or Junior Lemley. The first off being, I would never say that he invented the horror film, but I think there's a pretty strong argument to be made that he's the person most singularly responsible for horror becoming the genre that thrives until today. Because it's impossible to imagine without these films, we would have had these franchises. Yeah. Uh, and not to mention the endless remakes of the films that he made back then. And this whole convention all starts going back to the decision to make those films back there. And then lastly, I, I am of the opinion that Frankenstein is his true masterpiece. And what is Frankenstein ultimately but a father and son story? A creator trying to come to terms with its creation. So I want to leave you with the words of Junior's creator, his father. I didn't believe in horror pictures. None of our officers were for it. Only Junior wanted it. Only Junior stood out for it. He showed us all. Thank you. Thank you. So now I want to have Antonia Carlotta come up and join me. Antonia is the uh, great grandniece of Carl Lemley and cousin to Junior, and also. She is the host of a terrific uh, universe, or web series, Universally Me. Enough room for you there? <laughs> Great. Hi. Hi. So, we'll start off if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I, I read your wonderful book, which is Thank you. great. It's just a great book. Have you thought about making more stories about Carl Lemley with a different, different 
pictures that he made? Uh, I would certainly love to do it. Yes, I do have some ideas in mind how to continue the story forward because, as you can see, his story gets very interesting and uh, you know continues on from from here. Uh, no, I would love to read more books by you. Uh, thank you. By thank you. <laughs> I know, it's strange. I remember. That, that has been one of the nice things. I've gotten to know Antonia since the book came out and other members of the family, and they've all been very complimentary, and that's always been, you know, been nice because these are all heroes to me. Every, every one of them. And, oh, and, I, and I, I sort of, I did get back to one funny thing that, that has come up when I did some of the relatives that I've met who knew Junior. They all talked about in later years how much he loved horse racing. So it, it went back to his, his earlier days. That was one fun detail that, sorry, I meant to reincorporate. One thing that was really special for me about reading the book is that I feel like I've always gotten to know Carl and Junior through, I guess through photos, through stories, but it's always these little pieces. The book was like the first time that I got to, I don't know, imagine them as like, as full characters and get to experience like, what a you know a couple months in the life were like so that was a really special way to get to experience them thank you yeah that that was the goal to sort of make all of these people real you know boris karloff was a starving actor you know i mean bella lugosi was an actor who wanted bigger roles i mean it's just that they were human beings and i, and I love talking about the business in that context at that time any other questions anybody well, I have some questions. Or did you? Was there one up there? Oh, I'm sorry. There, there is one. Tell us what's your website again or your um, uh, YouTube channel? Yes, so yeah. I have a YouTube channel. Yes. It's called Universally Me, uh, where you can look up my name, Antonia Carlotta. It's all about the history of Universal Studios, Carl Lemley and Junior Lemley, their movies. You know, Carl Lemley Sr. is really an incredible man, not just for starting Universal Studios, but he also won a Supreme Court case against Thomas Edison. And uh, when he was retiring from the film industry, he also brought over 300 Jewish families from Europe to save them as Hitler was coming to power. So he was an incredible man, and so few people know about him and his work. So uh, Universally Me is a way to carry on his work and his legacy and hopefully get his name out there and get it the recognition that it deserves. Antonia has a bunch of really terrific videos exploring even more of the, the, the history of her fantastic family. Definitely check them out. Was there another question? I thought I saw Yeah, right here. Oh. oh, sorry, I can't see. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Carla Lemley lived to be 100. Exactly how was she related to Carl Jr.? I think they were first cousins, weren't they? Correct, yeah, and she lived to be 104 years old. Um, she was incredible. She spoke the opening lines in Dracula. She was the prima ballerina in Phantom of the Opera. And yes, she was Carl's brother's daughter uh, or Junior's first cousin. Yeah, she, uh, there's a lot of great interviews with her out there too and spoke very eloquently about her family and in fact talked about uh, a fair amount about her early days around Universal with Junior. Yeah, she lived on the Universal Studios lot starting when she was about eight or nine years old um, until she was, I think, like maybe about 20. So she, she lived there for quite some time and she had the most fairy tale stories of like waking up in the morning hearing the lions in the Universal Zoo roar or, you know, just kind of stumbling upon Lon Chaney filming uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, things like that. So, just incredible. Do you want to talk a little bit about your relationship with her? Because I know you were very close. Yeah, you know, be because she lived to be 104, I was so fortunate to get to spend so much time with her, usually just asking her questions and um, interviewing her about her life every day. Um, she was the sweetest woman in the world. She loved, she used to come to conventions like this all the time. That was like the highlight of her life and getting to talk about everything that she experienced. So just very special to get that time with her. And it was kind of amazing, even over the age of 100, she was completely there mentally. It was, yes. it was astounding to see interviews with her. She was it, just terrific. It felt so silly at 104 to say like, wow, I'm, I'm so surprised that she passed, but I was because she was so, just, I don't know, so with it and so spry and all the things to the end. I'd love to hear from you about like first discovering your family's legacy and, and 
you know, what it was like discovering this amazing background that your family had? Yeah, you know, I don't think I fully had a grasp of it when I was younger. I don't know, you know, if any kid really would. And at the time, I lived in Connecticut until I was about 12 or 13. So my mom had pictures of, you know, old movies and my family on sets, like, on the wall, and I would look at them and find them interesting, but I didn't really have anything to anchor those. Um, when I was 13, I moved to California, and that's when I really got to, like, see Universal and, I don't know, the Lemley Theaters, and, you know, just getting a, a greater sense of what Uncle Carl had accomplished. Um, and then again, learning about all these other things, the Supreme Court case against Thomas Edison and um, saving so many lives. I think that being in California, being amongst the industry and learning those things, that's when I really had a sense of, of what he accomplished. And then that's when I became really passionate about it. It's a, it's a tremendous legacy. Something interesting that I, I mentioned earlier that a lot of relatives reached out to me after the book came out, and what I found really fascinating were the ones that knew Junior later in life, some of them didn't even know he'd been in the film business. It seems so strange to me. <laughs> but, but, and again, I don't mean to speak for your family, what I'm gonna say here, but what I sort of understood the context was that we look at it like, if, and like you, if I had anything to do with Universal, that's all I would talk about. I'd be like, oh my God. But to Junior, this was a business they had lost. So I think there was some pain there because when I talked to some of the Stern side of the family in particular, because I would say, so what did he say? What did he talk about? They said, he didn't really talk about it. He was very happy, very social. I guess they had a lot of Sunday parties at his house, a lot of sporting events. Again, betting seems to have been a big part of his life. There was another uh, anecdote, which I haven't put in the presentation. I don't know if you're aware of this one, but he was involved just collaterally when somebody got robbed. Did you ever hear this story? It was a bookie. He happened to be on a bookie when the guy got robbed, and so that, that was another mention that, uh, so it, that, that sort of became a lot of his life later in life. He liked the track, and he liked to bet, and stayed very active socially. Anybody else have any questions <laughs> for me or Antonia, anything? Um, let me see, is there anything else you wanna add to? Uh... Um, no, I'm honestly, I'm just so excited and honored to see everybody out here. Um, I do hope that you all, you know, took something from the presentation. I hope you read the book, and I hope that you all share parts of Carl Lemley and Junior and and their work, and just keep the monsters living on. Yeah, and and Tony is doing a great job with, with her web series. Check check that out. Um, I'm at booth 45 for the rest of the convention, so come by and say hello. I do have my book there, um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. I think we're actually thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.